uh, good evening everyone um, we are now at the 12th session of the exoplanet course and uh, today as you know we have with us dr ravi koparapu you have been seeing him through the entire course and this is his second uh, session and uh, today he is going to talk about exoplanets life signatures so maybe a continuation of uh, sudha's talk uh, yesterday's uh, session yeah over to you Thank you, Prachi. Um, so I missed uh, Sudha's talk due to some technical difficulties yesterday. So I'm sure it was pretty good and pretty nice. Uh, there could be some overlap between her talk and my talk today. Uh, and uh, also, I must uh, apologize for my voice. I have, I have some cough, cold. So uh, I'll uh, try to see if I can get through his slides. Uh, without sounding too deep and too profound with my voice. All right, so uh, we are going to discuss today about exoplanet life signatures. And when I'm, what I mean by life signatures here is I'll be discussing about two different kinds of uh, life signatures that uh, currently we are trying to uh, observe and detect and characterize with upcoming telescopes. I am not going to discuss about that the missions and telescopes that uh, will be used to detect life signatures because the, we will have um, another talk by Dr. Prabhul Saxena uh, in the next few sessions. If I remember correctly, Prabhul did not give this talk yet. Um, and so we will only discuss about the, the life signatures here and the detection of any of these signatures, I'll leave it up to Bravo. And the, the, more specifically to the missions related to these kind of uh, uh, observations. As you can see from this slide, uh, there are two uh, pictures that I've added. One is from Yellowstone National Park and some uh, pictures of M dwarf planets, essentially indicating that we are trying to find biological life uh, that uh, we are very familiar with. And on the right hand side, you will see uh, an artist's imagination of how a technologically advanced civilization could look like and how we will be looking for uh, advanced civilizations uh, along with bio, uh, uh, biological life. And hence, we will be looking for both bio signatures and techno signatures. And this talk will discuss uh, both of these uh, uh, signatures in. Um, uh, as as a method of finding life on other planets. So a biosignature is uh, any, any substance or a molecule or, or an element or a feature or a characteristic of a planet that can be used as uh, evidence for past or present life. Um, the, this, when I'm talking about these signatures, uh, biosignatures, uh, I will be discussing about the remote detection of these on exoplanets. Sudha probably talked about these biosignatures for uh, in situ or local um, uh, observations and detection of biosignatures. So uh, similarly, uh, a technosignature is an observational evidence or manifestation of technological civilization, either past or present, just like biosignatures. We will come to that in a second. And so when we are looking for life on exoplanets, I want us to think about not only biosignatures, but both biosignatures and technosignatures as the possibility of some of the first detections we would could. Um, it will keep happening in, while I'm talking. So let me know when you can see, I think you'll tell me this. Sure. Okay, so uh, for this particular talk, uh, we will be looking for habitable worlds. We'll be looking for life on habitable worlds. And uh, some of you probably have uh, seen this slide in my beginning talk. Um, how common are potential habitable worlds in our galaxy? <coughs> According to one estimate, uh, we, as we think there are about 2 billion habitable zone terrestrial planets in our galaxy. How did we get to this number? Uh, I think I've given a homework for some of you. Uh, to estimate this number in my first talk based on the occurrence rate of planets in the habitable zones around G and K dwarf stars, KG and K stars, for example. And 
<coughs> assuming some number for uh, <coughs> the, <coughs> the number of stars in our galaxy, we can come up with this uh, number for uh, how many habitable zone planets are there. And so if you assume these, these are the number of ha potential habitable worlds in our galaxy, uh, we should then define something called the habitable zone uh, where uh, the number will be used uh, to find and discover uh, or to find targets to find life on other planets. Um, I am not sure if anyone discussed the concept of habitable zone. Uh, Jacob may have touched upon this um, if I remember correctly, but I do not know if anyone else discussed the concept of habitable zone. Maybe uh, participants, if you remember, you can just put it in the chat box or, you know, unmute yourselves and tell if. Yeah, just unmute and uh, let me know if uh, has anyone discussed the concept of habitable zone that uh, you remember. I'm not sure if uh, anyone did that. Um, well, if they didn't, maybe we'll go through this very quickly. Um, or maybe if they did, even then we can just discuss. The concept of habitable zone is for at least for the exoplanets is the region around a star where a terrestrial size or mass planet with a suitable atmosphere can maintain liquid water on its surface. Uh, you can see how carefully I've drafted this definition of the habitable zone. It's the region around a star where a terrestrial size or mass planet. So I'm putting limits on the size of the planet. Uh, with a suitable atmosphere, so I'm putting limits on what kind of an atmosphere the planet should have, can maintain liquid water, I'm putting what should be there uh, in liquid form on its surface. And so I'm making uh, it a constraint that the liquid water should be on its surface. So there are several uh, constraints I'm putting on the definition of the habitable zone specifically for uh, exoplanet habitable zone planets. The reason for that is because uh, we have only remote observations that we can use to detect planets, target planets that we can um, look for. This definition of the habitable zone has little to do with habitability. It doesn't mean if the planet is in the habitable zone, <coughs> it does not mean that it is habitable. It is only for a target for remote observations. Once you observe this planet, then you will determine if the planet has liquid water on its surface only. As far as uh, the first step is concerned, if the planet in if a Kepler telescope or some other uh, radial velocity technique or a transit technique detects a planet, <clears throat> we need to first figure out if the planet is in the habitable zone or not to figure out if we need to spend time on, with the telescope to look for liquid water on it uh, or not. So the first step is to find the planet in the habitable zone. And then the next step is to actually use uh, further observations to see if the planet is indeed uh, is habitable. When I say habitable, it means having liquid water on its surface. All right. See, I knew it. OK. You can still see it, right? My slides. Yes, it is seen. OK, good. So based on that definition of the habitable zone, uh, the, uh, uh, we've uh, published a couple of papers in 2013 and 2014, defining what a habitable zone looks, uh, look, should look like and what are the habitable zone for different kinds of stars. Our sun's habitable zone has um, both Earth and Mars. Uh, I'll come to this plot in a minute explaining what the x-axis and y-axis means. Maybe perhaps we can uh, start with that. On the x-axis of this plot, uh, you'll see the amount of starlight on the planet relative to the sunlight on Earth. Essentially, what it means is the amount of flux incident on the planet. A planet with 100% starlight uh, receiving from its host star implies that it is receiving the same amount of the light that the current Earth is receiving from our current sun, okay? And if a planet, if a planet has 75% member, that, that means that the planet is receiving only 75% of the starlight from its host star that the Earth is receiving from the sun, okay? So it's receiving 25% less. And similarly for 125% uh, and so on. 
it's receiving 25% more starlight uh, than the Earth is receiving. <clears throat> On the y-axis, we have the stars' uh, effective temperatures. Uh, and the hotter stars are larger in size, the, or the cooler stars are smaller in size. And uh, you can see that um, there are the sun, which is around 6,000 Kelvin, 5,800 Kelvin or so, <clears throat> has three planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, and then now we will discuss about what these boundaries of habitable zones uh, mean. Um, but, uh, you don't have to worry about the, uh, several of these um, uh, curves over here. The most important ones here are the runaway greenhouse and the maximum greenhouse. The runaway greenhouse is indicated by the yellow curve, um, uh, which is called the inner edge of the habitable zone, where if a planet, Earth-like planet around, <clears throat> around a star, if you take an Earth-like planet with a dense atmosphere of water wave, a water, and if you keep pushing it closer and closer uh, to the star, at some point, most of the water goes into the <coughs> atmosphere and that becomes a, um, a steam atmosphere and eventually the planet will lose uh, water from its uh, surface and that becomes the runaway greenhouse. The reason why it is called runaway greenhouse is because water vapor is a good infrared absorber and so when you are putting more water vapor into the atmosphere it uh, blocks the amount of heat or the infrared radiation going out of the planet and absorbs it. When it absorbs most uh, infrared radiation, it becomes hot. When it becomes hot, mo more water vapor goes into the atmosphere. And then when more water vapor goes into the atmosphere, more infrared radiation is absorbed that is uh, coming from the planet. And when more water vapor is absorbed from the planet, uh, it becomes even hotter and it becomes even harder then more water goes away again into the atmosphere. That becomes a runaway process. People think this is what happened on Venus, for example. So um, uh, once this process starts, this runaway mechanism, building water vapor in the atmosphere happens very quickly on a geological time scale, many couple million years or so, and the planet's, planet becomes uninhabitable. So as you're pushing the planet closer and closer to the star, there comes a point where most of the water goes into the atmosphere and that becomes your runaway greenhouse limit and that becomes your inner edge of the habitable zone. <clears throat> okay, so that's that yellow curve and you do the simulation for uh, different kinds of stars and you see where this uh, most of the water vapor goes into the atmosphere for different kinds of stars and you derive this runaway greenhouse limit yellow curve. <clears throat> we can do uh, an uh, uh, outer edge of the habitable zone limit as well, that is the maximum greenhouse. Essentially, what we do in our model is that you take an Earth-like planet and you try to make, take it away from the star. And you're, as you're moving away from the star, the planet tries to cool down. When you are trying to cool down, then uh, you pump more CO2, carbon dioxide, into the uh, atmosphere of the planet. And as you are pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, um, it becomes warmer because CO2 is a good greenhouse gas, as we know, because we humans are having this problem of uh, anthropogenic uh, global warming, climate change. And so as you're, as you're moving uh, the planet away from the star, you put more and more CO2 into the atmosphere so to make the planet um, uh, habitable, to maintain the temperature so that the liquid water will not freeze. So that freezing point of water is 273 Kelvin or zero degrees centigrade, right? So we try to keep the more planet in the more, uh, in our model, we try to keep the planet at 273 Kelvin by pumping CO2 into the atmosphere as we move planet away from the star. There comes a point actually, if you read the paper, there comes a point where as you're taking the planet away from the star and pumping more and more CO2, the even, uh, it becomes so cold that CO, carbon dioxide starts condensing because it becomes en cold enough <coughs> and uh, no amount of CO2 will not uh, be enough to warm the planet. And uh, <clears throat> the starlight will start reflecting because CO2 forms clouds and the, there is not enough starlight coming into the atmosphere, coming into the planet to warm the planet. 
So you can dump as much as CO2 you want, but the planet will not be warming. The point where the CO2 will not keep warming the planet is called the maximum greenhouse limit. That is the outer edge of the half zone, and that's the blue one. Uh, you can forget about recent Venus and uh, uh, early Mars limits that uh, we will discuss it if there are any questions in the <clears throat> in the more in the discussions. Um, from this figure, you can see around the sun, Venus is not in the habitable zone, current habitable zone. Earth and Mars are in the habitable zone, but as you know, Mars is not a habitable planet. Uh, 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 it's pretty clear, right? But how come then is this definition of the habitable zone broken? Well, according to the definition of the habitable zone, it is an earth size or Earth-like or uh, red similar planet. Mars is not an earth size similar planet. Some people may claim, how about Moon? Moon is not an Earth size or Earth limit planet and doesn't have a sort of atmosphere, similar to Mars. So even if it is in the habitable zone, it is not a habitable planet. And so the definition, that is why we frame the definition of the habitable zone according to uh, these criteria to match these criteria and also that can be applied for exoplanet atmospheres. You may notice an unusual thing on this plot. Uh, there are several exoplanets that we have discovered, confirmed exoplanets that we have discovered uh, that are in the habitable zone. We have put a limit on the size of the planets, the, uh, the minimum bound and the maximum bound for all these ones. Uh, the minimum bound we put is about half an Earth radii because that's the size of Mars. And uh, below that limit, we, uh, we think that the planet cannot hold uh, its atmosphere, which is what happened to Mars. Most of, uh, most of it is gone. And the maximum limit is 1.5 Earth radii because um, that's uh, beyond that, according to our statistics from the Kepler and TESS data sets. Above that 1.5 Earth radii limit, we see that uh, planets are accumulating dense hydrogen atmospheres. And so they stop becoming uh, terrestrial planets above this limit. And so we put that limit as one because habitable zone definition is, uh, is entirely for a terrestrial size planet and not necessarily for other planets. We think that we should limit our uh, size limits to 1.5 Earth radii. And because of that, we have a low limit of half an Earth radii and 1.5 Earth radii as the limits for the habitable zone planets. As you can see, there are several uh, confirmed exoplanets that are discovered here, and you may see an unusual pattern here. And the unusual pattern here is that <clears throat> many of these planets are seem to be around cool stars and M stars, <clears throat> and that is not a surprise. Because of our detection techniques are sensitive to smaller stars, and because around smaller stars, the habitable zones are closer, even though it may not appear here on this flux plot, it appears that the habitable zones are further away, okay? But in the distance plot, in the distance uh, plane, if I plot this in a distance plane, you will see that the habitable zones are closer to the star. Um, and because of that, the, they're, they're, you can get more number of orbits around cooler stars and you will be able to find more and more number of planets in which is what is happening over here. You may ask, why do we see habitable zones further away from uh, around a cooler star, whereas habitable zones appear to be very close uh, to, uh, to a hotter star? Because you see that it's a bend, and the bend up seems to be clo you know, more closer towards a hotter star, and the bend appears to be uh, more further away for around a cooler star. So we will discuss this in the question and answer session. <clears throat> if you have, uh, if you want to think about it, uh, the answer lies in uh, infrared radiation and Rayleigh scattering. So, before we end this uh, session, think about it and see why that is so. Remember, the x-axis is the starlight on a planet. It's the amount of starlight radiation uh, spectrum that the planet is receiving from the star. <clears throat> okay, enough about the habitable zones. So there are some fundamental questions um, about uh, um, the biosignatures here uh, that we want to uh, discuss. 
One of them is what does life produce on a planet to for us to detect it? Because we need to know what kind of a planet we want to detect. Also, can a dead planet fool us? Essentially a false positive. Maybe a dead planet can produce a similar biosignatures as a living planet. And so we might want to discuss that. Also, how do we interpret limited data? Remember that when we are trying to uh, look at the atmosphere or when we are trying to image an exoplanet, we don't get a clear Earth-like, uh, a high resolution Earth picture ever. Uh, not in the present, uh, not with the present telescopes. So we will get only some pixelated images. So those are limited data. So how do we interpret the limited data and try to understand and try to detect if the planet has life on it? <clears throat> And also, um, excuse me. And how do we quantify? Oops, how do we quantify uh, our uncertainties or our certainties? Rather, uh, I think it went away. Uh, how do we quantify our certainties uh, in in terms of how we can characterize the planets? Let me okay. Um, uh, understanding the life on other planets, they may be having slightly different uh, atmospheric conditions, and how do we know? Uh, with the limited data, which atmospheric conditions are suitable and based on those, how can we understand that the planet has life or not? How can we, how can we be confident uh, on detecting life on other planets? Mm. So here is a plot of the uh, evolution of Earth's atmospheric conditions over the last 4.5 billion years. This is how biology has changed our atmosphere. The y-axis here is the amount of the gas percentage in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so one is 1%, 10 is 10%, 0.1 is 0.1% and so on. As you all know, the current atmospheric conditions of our oxygen is 21%, right? Um, there are only few gases uh, that are plotted here. On the x-axis is the time, 4.5 billion years to the present. Zero is the present time scale, okay? All right. Mm. You can see that the CO2, carbon dioxide has existed since last 4 billion years, seems to be the most uh, long lived gas on the earth. Um, also probably one of the most primary uh, gas molecule that earth probably has accumulated uh, in its uh, evolutionary time period. You can see <clears throat> that over the last 4 billion years, CO2 amount has gone down a little bit. Uh, also there was some methane when the first life came, uh, when methane was uh, a little bit abundant, the first life arrived and uh, photos at the, about the same time, photosynthesis also started around a billion years after the earth formed, the one, okay? Um, and when the photosynthesis started, you can see the red curve, which is the oxygen started increasing. And because of that, the first oxygen users or the first oxygen <laughs> life started happening and eventually methane dropped down and oxygen dominated um, uh, the atmosphere and large organisms started uh, becoming more prevalent and oh my god large organisms started becoming more prevalent and they uh, now we have uh, two most dominant gases in our atmosphere are nitrogen and oxygen and this plot by the way does not include nitrogen at all uh, and we have very limited amount of, uh, of CO2 and a very few, very, very limited amount of methane. Once oxygen started dominating, methane went down completely because you can see this crossover point between the green curve and the red curve because there is a uh, oxygen and uh, methane are reactive substances and uh, uh, methane went down quite quickly. And so if you see methane in an oxygen dominated atmosphere, there must be a source for the methane. Something must be producing methane. In our Earth's atmosphere, that produ production mechanism, that source is life. And so people started thinking that, okay, if you see uh, uh, <coughs> oxygen methane together, that could be a good indicator for a biosignature or a habitable planet or inhabited planet to be to that for that matter. Okay. Um, 
However, we have to keep in mind that uh, biology does not uh, happen or, you know, the evolution of biology on Earth is not happening in an isolated event. It is happening probably or maybe uh, in reaction to how our sun's luminosity has changed over the last four billion years. And so there is a interplay between how sun has evolved, as you all know, in, from stellar evolution from Dr. Ken um, uh, talk, from the first talk, uh, all stars brighten uh, uh, from their formation time to their uh, end times. <clears throat> and right now, sun is also brighten, brightening. About, 20, uh, about 2 billion years or 3 billion years ago, uh, the sun was about only 25% the brightness um, uh, uh, of the current brightness level. And uh, even then, at that time, you can see from this plot that life existed. About 3 billion years ago from now, uh, from here, uh, they, there was life. There were methanogens, there was methane, there was CO2, even though the sun was uh, only 25% brighter. And this was called the faint young sun paradox that how come there was life on Earth, even though there was, um, the sun was less bright, and even though there was uh, not enough uh, source of energy for life to form, but we still see uh, <clears throat> evidence of life. <clears throat> and there were a couple of um, couple of uh, possible solutions. One of them is that the Earth and the life reacted to that and made Earth warm enough. It's not that Earth doesn't have any atmosphere. When the sun was less bright, Earth probably had uh, a dense enough CO2 atmosphere to make it warm enough to have life on its surface, which is what you probably see here on the left plot. CO2 was uh, most abundant there at that time in the earlier uh, 3 billion, three, 4 billion years ago, and probably kept Earth warm enough <coughs> for life to sustain. Okay, so the point of this slide is to show that there is an interplay between the sun, uh, even sol solar evolution, and the evolution of life on Earth. And it will probably keep happening uh, over the next uh, few million or hundred million years. Okay, there are different types of biosignatures that we will be able to discuss. Uh, we have discussed only one of them in from the previous plot, uh, one uh, common type, which is oxygen and methane together because of the current Earth situation. Uh, there are uh, three types of biosignatures that we could discuss. One, is, uh, one of them is gaseous biosignatures, surface biosignatures, and temporal biosignatures. Within the gaseous biosignatures, and <clears throat> as we have seen, oxygenic photosynthesis uh, could generate um, uh, a signal for us to detect and create byproducts from uh, this photo oxygenic photosynthesis. For example, ozone. Uh, when, when you produce a large amount of oxygen, uh, UV radiation could photolyze oxygen molecules to create ozone molecules, and they could be uh, uh, seen as a, a potential biosignature, uh, uh, biosignatures that uh, could indicate life on the planet. And so in addition to oxygen and methane, we could also look for ozone uh, as a photolytic byproduct that uh, it gives an indication of uh, biology on the planet. Uh, okay, so we could also think about the surface biosignatures. Uh, what the surface biosignatures are where we would see if there are plants or grass or some kind of a pigment in the water, for example, could, in, could be seen in the spectrum of the planet that could indicate some kind of an activity, a biological activity. And so that is um, an, uh, a surface biosignature, which we'll come to that in the next couple of slides, uh, could indicate some uh, idea about what kind of biology is going on. For example, uh, we see green plants on earth uh, because of chlorophyll, uh, because those are the ones that we, uh, uh, those are the kinds of colors that we see on our sun is uh, emitting most of its radiation in the visible part of the spectrum. However, around M stars, which are cooler stars, they appear black. If there is a planet around a, uh, an M star, habitable planet around an M star, if there are plants on it, those plant leaves would be black because they want to absorb as much 
radiation from the star as possible because the M stars emit less radiation compared to the sun. Uh, you can see my uh, colleague Nancy Kiang's paper from 2007 to, um, <clears throat> uh, to know more about this one. Uh, there is also temporal biosignatures. Those are called uh, how the biosignatures change over time. Uh, for example, if you look at the carbon dioxide variation from on Earth, uh, you would see over a year, uh, carbon dioxide varies because the trees in the Northern Hemisphere, or even the trees, uh, uh, change seasonally because if they go through uh, winter, spring, summer, fall, and again winter. And because the amount, the num uh, amount of tree uh, uh, life reduces and then grows back again, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere also changes. And you can clearly see that in the Earth's spectrum. Or if you take a measure of the CO2 on Earth for over a period of one year, we can see this change. And so when you look at an exoplanet and observe it for a year, and if you see this kind of change, that could be a potential indicator for uh, some kind of a, you know, biological life on the planet, seasonal variation, essentially. All right, so um, how am I doing on time? I'm good? Okay. All right, so this is a, a, a spectrum of uh, Earth. Uh, it's called uh, <clears throat> the Earth shine spectrum, essentially the light reflected from the Earth uh, uh, from the sun, uh, so the light coming from the uh, sun gets reflected from the earth, goes to the moon, and then we take that reflected light back from the moon, and that's called the earth shine spectrum. We take the spectrum of the light coming back from the moon, um, and that's called the earth shine spectrum. And when you take that earth shine spectrum, you can see uh, what kind of signatures are there in the spec our uh, earth spectrum itself. This is essentially like simulating an exoplanet spectrum coming from somewhere else. Okay, so we can start. And if you, when we spread the spectrum from the UV, ultraviolet region, optical, visible infrared to near infrared, uh, we will see several features. In the UV part of the spectrum and the optical part of the spectrum, uh, you would see oxygen and ozone, particularly ozone in the UV part of the spectrum. And in, most importantly, you will see. Um, uh, Rayleigh scattering as an indicator of nitrogen atmosphere uh, in the optical and UV part of the spectrum, it increases. It, there would be a slope like that. Uh, in the near infrared, around close to the near infrared, uh, around 0.6 or 0.7 microns, you would see something called vegetation red edge or vegetation jump, indicating the presence of land plants. I'll come to this in a minute. What this spectrum is showing is that when you, when you are looking at an exoplanet spectrum at this wavelength, if you are measuring the brightness of a planet or a reflection, reflectivity of a planet, you would see that as you're going from UV to optical to near infrared, suddenly there is a brightness increase of the planet if there is plant life on, the, on, the, on that planet. That's called a jump, vegetation jump or the vegetation red edge because the vegetation reflects more in the infrared or near infrared part of the spectrum compared to the optical. I'll show you that in a minute, okay? This is getting annoying. Um, and so, and we can also see some water vapor features suggesting that the planet has water on it. There is some feature of carbon dioxide suggesting volcanic activity, which could imply plate tectonics on the planet. Methane could possibly indicate the presence of uh, uh, anaerobic bacteria or presence of life. However, if you just see methane and nothing else on this plot, that could also be produced by uh, abiotic mechanisms, something naturally being produced. So we need to see oxygen, ozone, water vapor, CO2, methane, all of them together as a potential indicator of a potential habitable or a biosignature planet. No one signal, no one gas is a biosignature. <clears throat> All right. So here is the plot of the vegetation red edge. You can see the reflectance being plotted on the y-axis and wavelength in microns plotted on the x-axis. 
the point two microns is essentially the UV part of the spectrum. Uh, the near infrared starts around 0.7 or so uh, uh, microns, and everything after that is uh, infrared part of the spectrum. You can see when I'm plotting the reflectance, and if I'm plotting it for different kinds of grass or leaves or trees, uh, suddenly from optical part of the spectrum from 0.2 to 0.6 micron, it appears flat somewhat, but suddenly around 0.7 micron onwards, there's a big jump in the reflectivity. That's because uh, plants and terrestrial plants reflect more in the infrared part of the spectrum, okay? So here is an example. This is a photo of a tree in the visible light. Okay, this is how we see. And here is a picture of uh, the same tree in the infrared. And you can see it's more bright. It's more reflective. This is what we see in this kind of spectrum. When we are looking with our infrared eyes, we can, we can see this, but we cannot see this. Uh, animals uh, who, which, can, uh, which are sensitive to have this vision, in infrared vision, can see this, for example. Okay, <clears throat> again, so the earth strength spectrum, a little bit more clear here. This is from a paper by Maggie Turnbull, my colleague. So you can see that if you take the earth strength spectrum, you can see several signatures of habitable planet over here. Methane, water, um, water vapor, oxygen, several oxygen bands, subbands, ozone, and O4, you'll see something called an O4, that is the oxygen, oxygen collision induced absorption, because there's so much oxygen that two oxygen molecules collide together in the high pressure um, environment and can produce a signal uh, within the spectrum. There is vegetation red edge around 0.7 micron. There's also a radius slope that I just talked about because of the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Uh, the sky is blue, right? It's reflectivity. That also increases uh, in the more and more towards the uh, lower part of the uh, blue part of the spectrum. And this is literally why sky appears blue, right? Because it's more reflective. And that is why you see that Rayleigh slope, <clears throat> uh, because that's happening because of the nitrogen atmosphere. <clears throat> um, Okay, <clears throat> here is the Earth's reflected and near infrared uh, emitted light uh, on the left hand side and Earth's thermal and infrared spectrum. So, uh, the left hand plot is from how we will see Earth when there is a reflected light from the Earth and we take a spectrum of it. So, the sunlight comes to the Earth, it bounces back, and we take a spectrum, and that's what we see on the left one. Whereas the right hand side, is the thermal emission infrared spectrum. The planet itself is emitting, not reflecting, emitting because it has a temperature, a certain temperature. And that certain temperature, because of that, every body, every every body has its own temperature and they emit that temperature in the infrared part of the spectrum. Earth also has that one. And so what is that temperature? If you plot several uh, Planck functions, you can see that they closely match to about 280, uh, 280 Kelvin, roughly 280 Kelvin. And so Earth's emission temperature is around 280 Kelvin, and the peak of that Planck function happens around 10 microns. And so if you are able to build a detector that uh, could detect this emission spectrum, the thermal emission of the Earth, uh, you would be able to see these features, and we can see several features over here. There's a 15 micron feature for carbon dioxide. Oops, okay. And uh, several other ones uh, that you can see if you have it, if you would have a detector, you'd see uh, water vapor, CO2, methane, and ozone also at around nine micron, uh, 9.6 micron and so on. So there are a couple ways we can do this. One, uh, if you want to find a biosignature on a planet, you can see in the reflected light, you can build a detector to see the reflected light. You can also build a detector that could uh, see the emission, thermal emission spectrum of a planet. Okay, here is, uh, I should have given uh, um, uh, a credit to this. This is from a colleague of mine who's an excellent colleague here, Jake Lustig Eager, who made this uh, a plot based on his work and also Ty Robinson's work. Here is, um, uh, uh, focus on the left hand side of the plot here the flux of the uh, planet uh, reflected uh, i think it's the yes reflected light uh, on the y-axis and x-axis is the wavelength in micron 
And if you select certain bands, those are the error bars that you see on the spectrum of the earth. You select certain bands and then um, track them over next over the 48, uh, 48 hours or so. And you see that you will, I call this the breathing planet. You will see that uh, as you are uh, uh, tracking the, those particular ba wave bands, the feet, because of the rotation of the planet and because there are several features on Earth, they are not uniform. Earth is not uniform. Continents, land, uh, ocean, uh, all these things change and affect uh, as the planet is rotating. Uh, they affect the flux of the coming from the planet as the planet is rotating. And because of that, you would see this variation, this wavy curve coming from the planet as you track the planet over the 48 hours of its rotation. This is just an example for Earth. You may ask, not every planet may have 24 hour rotation. True, but this tells us that if you can track an exoplanet over a certain time period, maybe we can see a similar wavy nature and can figure out how the uh, land surface, how the ocean, and how the distribution of uh, uh, land and ocean changes the flux on the planet. Here is another cool plot. Oh, okay, there you go. As you tra keep tracking the same curve for over the next, <clears throat> I don't know, couple months or something, you can see uh, you will uh, see seasonal changes. Earth's wave shows, of course, wavelength dependent phase and uh, diurnal variations over a long time scale. And so over uh, 600 hours, and 600 hours is probably, I don't know, 20 days, a month or something. <clears throat> over a month, you would see this you know, big change in variation. And if you can, if you are able to track its rotation of an exoplanet at certain wavelength bands, those are the error bars. Maybe you can see this kind of variation on the exoplanet that could tell us about the surface features, uh, tell us about the ocean coverage could also tell us about ice coverage and so on, uh, if we have at the end of telescope time for that. Okay, so how can we identify a, a, a planet that is- uh, Excuse me, well, yes. uh, Professor, I just had a doubt with the previous plot. Uh, so, so what we are tracking is just the error bars in, in the flux. That's what we are keeping track on. Yes, not the whole spectrum. That's why those error bar points are the ones we are mm -hmm. keeping track of. So, and then, so uh, also, how do we collect this data? Is it outside of Earth's atmosphere or is it a ground based or is it a balloon in the sky? Good question. So, this is a simulation that was made by my colleague, I said, right? So, this is, <laughs> this was made for, um, <clears throat> uh, for a mission, NASA mission, uh, when we launch it outside. Uh, so, that's a space based mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, we and that space-based mission would collect data at certain wavelength points. So it's outside the Earth's atmosphere for this particular one. You can do similar thing for ground-based observations also, but no one has done that this kind of animation. Okay. So, so also the if if it's outside the atmosphere, on like. So on the error bar be a lot big because like at, like because we can never say how the uh, atmosphere would look like at a time like there might be clouds or there might be sudden uh, uh, changes in the sky. Uh, so these are not, uh, if I understand correctly from what I read from this plot, oh my god. Okay, <clears throat> these are not the error bars as such. These are actually wavelength bands. There are no, there is no actual observation mm -hmm. simulation done here. Okay. You see the yeah. horizontal lines on these points Yes. Those tell us the extent uh, of the instrument's ability to watch within that central band. So if you see one particular band and you see a horizontal line, if I understand correctly, those are that particular instrument can look at from, let's say, uh, you know, plus or minus 0.2 micron band. Yeah, I, I think I get it now. So these yeah. are just simulations um, concentrated on, a, on on one particular central bands. That's it. Central bands, but this is not an actual observation. When you do an actual yeah, observation okay. simulation, then you would see error bars on the vertical axis. Okay. So can I know uh, what pipeline they used for this simulation? Like what constraints were used or like 
where I can refer some more information about this? I think I'll have to put you in contact with Jake or maybe I have to ask Jake. There's a paper, by the way, uh, for this one. So I'll ask yeah. Jake and uh, get back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just remind me uh, or send an email. To yeah, you. sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. All right. So we're almost at the end of this biosignature one. So uh, how am I doing with time, uh, Prachi? Uh, yes, we have around half an hour or so. To it's, finish this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, including the discussion, discussion or just for the lecture? Yeah, for the lecture, yeah, we can, you know, it's totally up to you. What, what time is it? It's 5.20 now. It's 5.20. 520. Okay, great. You can so, end at 6, including the question answers and discussion. Okay, I'm almost there. All right, so... How can we identify a habitable and inhabitable plant, inhabited planet here? So this is a picture of uh, probably several, several of you know, a picture of Earth taken from the Saturn with the Cassini mission. Uh, essentially, this is what we are trying to do for an exoplanet. So what we do is we want to take an image of the exoplanet. However, that image of the exoplanet will be very unresolved. And uh, this is just a simulation of how unresolved that exoplanet image would be. We may have in our mind that we will see a completely resolved, high contrast, high, highly resolved Earth like planet. But what we may get is this. This is one with our current telescopes, with our planned missions. This is what we may get. And all the information, all the things that I just talked to you should come from this particular pixel the variation, the rotation of the planet, the biosignatures, the pigments, the vegetation red edge, the Rayleigh scattering, the water, uh, water vapor, oxygen, methane combinations, reflectivity of the plants, everything should come from this dot. So that is what we are trying to do in, an exo in the exoplanet sense. From this dot, from this change in colors, so this is in the blue color, you can observe the planet in the red color, which is the red filter. From this dot, we are trying to find if the planet is habitable or not, because our current telescopes can resolve only this much. If we build bigger telescopes, if we have enough vision to build bigger telescopes, we can get maybe four dots here, or even larger telescopes could do maybe, I don't know, 16 dots, then we would be able to resolve continents, oceans on the planet, okay? All right. <clears throat> When we say that we want to find Earth-like planets, we want to, as I said, we want to know which kind of Earth-like planet we want to find. Earth has evolved over the time, so we want to see, you know, past Earth has a different structure. For example, here is a plot I've shown you before. Uh, Earth was having a lot of methane and uh, carbon dioxide uh, three, uh, two or three billion years ago. And ozone was little less, oxygen was little less two billion years ago. Uh, but Earth is dominated by ozone and oxygen in the current Earth. So when we are looking for Earth-like life, we want to look for Earth through time uh, kind of life. <clears throat> That's why we need to build an observatory that could cover all, <coughs> all these wavelengths where we do not want to miss any of these signals, any of these uh, gases. Also, uh, uh, at some point in Earth's history, we had a hazy uh, atmosphere, but, and haze could also be a potential biosignature. This is a paper from uh, one of my colleagues, um, Jara Arni, where uh, she uh, uh, published uh, uh, a paper where if you have a thick haze, which is a red one, and no haze, a black one, you can clearly see how a thick haze affects the spectrum of a planet, and, and, and then can comment upon whether the planet's haze <laughs> is arising from um, uh, uh, from life or not, and if it is, what kind of life is causing that kind of a haze? Okay, so here is a summary of biosignature combinations uh, that we can uh, get to. So if you want to have a strongest oxygen-rich biosignature, you need to have ozone, Rayleigh scattering, that's the lambda to the power of minus four, water vapor, oxygen, and methane. Strong oxygen-rich atmosphere will also have ozone and oxygen, including water. Similarly, for a different kind of an earth, uh, you can see different variations here of the combination of gases. Note one important thing here. None of them 
have uh, a single gas as a biosignature. It's a combination of gases. So when we can never claim, if you see an oxygen only atmosphere, that it is a habitable planet or inhabited planet. It is wrong rather to claim that it is, uh, uh, it is a habitable planet because nature is far, far clever than us and it can produce any other, it can produce mechanisms that could completely fool us. So a combination of biosignatures and the amount of gases, the amount of fluxes uh, at which these gases are being produced on the planet is another or even more constraint uh, on uh, building confidence that this planet could be habitable, okay? Okay, so I'm going to pause here because just uh, this is just a summary of biosignatures. Maybe then we will start, I'll start talking about technosignatures. Perhaps I'll finish the technosignatures as well. And then uh, we'll come back to the questions because we are getting short on time. Uh, so a habitable planet could also have technology just like our earth. Uh, and so we want to also find tech <coughs> technosignatures. Uh, I've discussed this before, just as tech biosignatures, technosignatures are also <clears throat> manifestations of extraterrestrial technology. And because biosignatures are motivated by life on Earth, we've seen past life on Earth, technosignatures could also be motivated by Earth's technological evolution. Um, the point of uh, technosignatures and how to look for them is to see if we can collaborate with our biosignatures colleagues and use their same telescopes and the same techniques and same instruments to observe any potential technosignatures. Essentially, biosignatures and technosignatures are two sides of the same coin. Use the same coin to find one of them or both of them. <clears throat> there are different, I'll very briefly go through different types of techniques involved here, photometric detection, spectroscopic detection, and image mapping. So what kind of technosignatures we can look for? <clears throat> Transiting structures. If an alien civilization is building um, big structures, then we can look for uh, these structures in the transits of, uh, of, of the star. Uh, you have uh, studied the transits before. And so different structures produce different transiting signatures and we can potentially look for those kind of structures and figure out what kind of structures they are. Waste heat from galactic civilizations. Uh, any object has to, if it's using energy, has to produce waste. So if a technological civilization is using waste, uh, is using energy, it has to discard its waste heat. And if it's using energy intensively on a galactic level, then there might be a way for us to detect these uh, waste heat from galaxies and stars to figure out if it's coming from uh, these kind of a large civilizations or it is coming from dust also could produce a false positive. Uh, detection of surface uh, signatures, surface mapping. So if you see, uh, if you want to find a uh, if we have a telescope that can resolve surfaces of a planet, we can look at the planet surface and see uh, if these can be, uh, if these are produced by alien civilizations, or it could be a surface structure produced by natural processes. There's also another paper by my colleague Manasvi Lingam, uh, where uh, uh, just like a vegetation red edge, you can see if a planet is covered with uh, solar cells, solar panels to harness the star's energy, you can see a red edge or a, a you know, solar edge, a cell panel edge in the reflectivity of the spectrum, okay? City lights, when you are looking at this, one of my colleague Thomas Beatty uh, uh, wrote this paper last year, where you can see city lights on the planet using upcoming telescopes. That is completely possible now, it's, that's a good one. There's also atmospheric uh, technosignatures. Uh, many of these technosignatures are uh, byproducts of industrial activity on, on the planet. These are passive searches. They don't have to do anything. They just can do about their own thing. And we just point our telescope, get a spectra and see if there is any pollution in the atmosphere. 
because of the industrial activity? What kind of gases we can we look for? Well, during the COVID time, uh, we have seen that uh, nitrogen dioxide is a uh, US ones. We can get similar things for uh, uh, other countries as well. Uh, in the urban areas, those are the red ones, uh, very densely populated ones. During the COVID time from January to, January to uh, March 2020, uh, industrial activity reduced quite a bit because the factory shut down. And this is the nitrogen dioxide activity went down quite a bit. And so uh, we use that and we figured that, okay, nitrogen dioxide has a strong absorption in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, those are those blue curves, but in infrared part of the spectrum, uh, they have lots of other gases are overlapping. So we cannot distinguish between other gases. So we should look for uh, nitrogen dioxide as an industrial activity for alien industrial civilizations. And so we published a paper and we figured that we can potentially detect Earth, current Earth, or even the Earth 40 years ago when there was more pollution, because now we are aware we reduced the pollution. But 40 years ago, Earth's pollution was much more. Uh, we could detect uh, nitrogen dioxide with upcoming uh, some space telescope, a large space uh, telescopes. So it is not a science fiction anymore. We can, we are indeed in the state where we can produce, we can detect uh, pollution from. Uh, other industrialized civilizations. Similarly, there are other uh, gases, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, that you use in the um, refrigerators or aerosols uh, that you use in spray paints. Those CFCs are harmful for ozone. And so they are banned <clears throat> uh, in most of the countries. Here is a plot uh, from 1970 to 2020s. Uh, and the CFCs on both levels, on both panels here. Um, you can see that the CFCs were increasing in the 1980s and up to 19, mid 1990s. And after that, they started going down. And that is because uh, there was a Montreal protocol where uh, several countries thought that uh, we should decrease the amount of CFCs and they put uh, some restrictions and the CFCs went down. So we did an estimate of how these CFCs could be detectable and it turns out that uh, with James Webb Space Telescope, we can detect these uh, on Trappist um, uh, these CFCs. <clears throat> so, this is my last slide. Industrial pollutants of uh, nitrogen dioxide and CFCs are possible to detect uh, with upcoming space telescope, and no single gas is a biosignature. And so, same thing with the techno signature. No single techno signature gas is a sure shot that we have detected a techno signature. Um, I think uh, that is my last slide. Okay, so how about we uh, open this up for discussion and then we can go from there. Uh, any... Okay, what happens if we push Mars closer to the sun? Which Mars? Present Mars or uh, prior Mars? Uh, ancient mass or the current mass. Okay, maybe I can present mass. Well, it'll atmosphere, whatever atmosphere it has, it will just go away because of the sun's radiation. CO2 will just escape. It's already gone. So whatever is there will be gone as well. Oh God, it's gone again. Because the sun's radiation will split CO2 and then it'll just, the mass will lose its atmosphere at some point if you push it closer. Okay, so we are open for questions. So ask anything more. <clears throat> Yes, you can please unmute yourselves and ask. Yeah. Because I can't see any question in the chat box. Like there is one, but I think this was already taken. What happens if we push mass closer to the sun? Yeah, I just answered that. Yeah.
Hi, Dr. Ravi. Can I check? Because um, my line was disconnecting when you were discussing about the runway greenhouse and maximum greenhouses. Is it right to say um, that the planet's beyond this? Can you say that again? Did we lose him? Oh. Can you repeat the question? I think he was asking, are there planets beyond this? So, sorry, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. I was just checking um, if the planets beyond this maximum greenhouse and runway greenhouse lines, are they not necessarily targets for detection? Or... <laughs> no, yeah, so they are. We do not want to miss any of them. These are what the, 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 the limits runaway greenhouse and the maximum greenhouse are called the most uh, conservative limits. Essentially, what it means is that the habitable zone can be at least this much wide between runaway greenhouse and the maximum greenhouse. But the habitable zone could be as wide as the recent Venus and early Mars. So if the planets are in between that red curve and the yellow curve, they still will be targets. However, we will be prioritizing the planets within the conservative habitable zone between the yellow and the blue one. All right. Yeah, excuse me, I have a question about here. Yeah. Uh, if you can hear me, uh, um, it is we we say the sun's. Uh, I mean, the sun is four, around four point six billion years old, and the Earth is around four point five billion years ago. So we have evolved, and today the civilization which exists on Earth, whatever it is, and if we are looking at other planets and other suns or other stars, suppose the uh, age of that star is uh, six or seven billion years. So the civilization in those planets. Mm -hmm which may be existing, might have been a more advanced civilization. Can we say that? Um, your guess is as good as mine. There may not even be a civilization, even it is 7 billion years, right? Right, right, right. Or if, if the star is, say, younger star, uh, so the planet is also younger, so the civilization could also be younger, like not, a caveman, for example. Well, not necessarily. So okay. we have written a couple of papers here. So for example, these F stars here, uh -huh. stars around 7,000 Kelvin. Uh -huh. uh, their lifetime is only two or three billion years, whereas sun's lifetime is 10 billion years. Right, right. So because they are so, uh, have the time scales for their life is so small, maybe life will adapt in such a way that they evolve faster than around a sun-like star. Okay, yeah. Okay. They may not need this long. <laughs> that is one thought not necessarily the only thought. So there is no one particular uh, criteria how evolution happens. We are entirely basing it on how Earth evolved. Right. right. Very, very uh, Earth-centric view. Yes, yes. So the, the evolution process there might be different or in a different form. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I would like to know is that, I don't know, a long time ago I had read about carbon being the basic... Um, uh, atom through, I mean, the whole organic chemistry has evolved because of carbon. carbon. And they were thinking of uh, having silicon kind of life where silicon can also, you know, bond with other uh, atoms and a kind of life would be there with silicon yeah. atoms. Is yeah. this still, is this still, I mean, valid this, this kind of discussion? Not to my uh, understanding because I'll give you an example. Um, maybe, in fact, I can even pull up uh, some, uh, let me see, uh, periodic table here, periodic table. The reason why I'm asked, uh, pulling it up because, can you all see this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> this is Wikipedia's periodic table. The reason why people suggest carbon uh, and the silicon life is because uh, silicon is in the same group as carbon, just below carbon, right? Right, right. Okay. Um, if someone is claiming that silicon, why carbon is uh, uh, considered to be the most uh, important uh, one for life? Because carbon can form gas. 
it can carry uh, energy or, you know, uh, it can form bonds. Yeah. Like the other chemicals pretty easily. And so it can travel within the, an organism as a gas to, mm -hmm. to different parts of the body, carrying information, carrying energy, carrying nutrients, whatever. It's, it can flow through the body pretty easily. Silicon is actually solid. Yeah, in, yeah, 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 yeah. In the yeah. Earth's so, temperature, to make it a gas, you need to increase the temperature to un, enormous levels. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do that, life will not exist anyway at that temperatures. Right, right, right. So silicon, if you want to have silicon life, well then how would you make a solid silicon travel through you, the body of a metabolic activity? Okay, so that, that thought is no more valid, I would say. Not to my knowledge. I mean, mm -hmm. it might be, again, nature is very clever. Uh, I'm not. And so silicon is a solid material that cannot travel through the body. Have you seen any solid material traveling through the body? No, right? And so silicon is a solid material that has to carry the same thing as carbon uh, when we are, you know, to do the metabolic activity. And yeah, I think even the the the, the nucleosynthesis. I mean, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen happen. I mean, they happen to be more abundant also than exactly. Know. That's another point I was going to make. The yeah. most dominant yeah. elements are hydrogen, helium, and yes. then oxygen. Yeah. Then carbon and nitrogen. Right, right, right. And so life will take the most abundant. Only those. Yeah. And why would it go? you know, out of the way to do it. What about the life concern with viruses? Because viruses happen to be on the borderline between living and non-living. Well, but they could be there, uh, which we just didn't, we just don't know. We have it here. They could be there on other plants as well. Yeah, so those signatures would be different? Uh, they have to, uh, if you are asking for exoplanet atmospheres, then they have to show up in the spectra. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to detect them. <clears throat> So we how? To, yeah, how? So that <laughs> yeah. we need to emit gas. What gas? Are they emitting any gas? Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. Exactly. So we don't know actually what kind of gas. If they're emitting gases, then we should probably be aware of it because viruses invade us, right? In our bodies and so on. And so unless they emit gas and that show up in the spectrum of a planet, we would not be able to detect them. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yep. Uh, Mega, can you just speak up? I'm reading it. Uh, when you look out. Yeah, Mega, maybe you can unmute yourself. I'm just reading her question. Okay. Uh, when we look for technologies, how do we find some kind of that may be common to all habitable zones. Um, so this connects probably with the carbon talk that we just had. Uh, any life requires carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. Those are the hydrocarbons. Okay, that's fine. Um, any uh, carbon or hydrogen or oxygen. So uh, we have our technology based on fossil fuels and the fossil fuels are coming from hydrocarbons, right? And so uh, we will assume that other planets may also have to go through similar fossil fuel uh, technology because those are the common elements that are abundant. We just talked about it. And so if you are asking what are the common technology to all habitable zone planets, I would say probably fossil fuels. Out of my own knowledge. Okay, there's another question. What is the difference between carbon and silicon based life? Well, we just talked about it. Uh, I don't think a silicon based life is possible because silicon is a solid material and don't know how it can transport energy. Through the bodies. Oops. <clears throat> Wait 
can see. Yeah, can see. sorry. Oh, one more question, if you don't mind. Um, how are you focusing on certain planets? I mean, presently, there are so many planets, you mentioned about 200, <laughs> so many, so many codes and so on. But uh, like you mentioned all this throughout this talk, but still, uh, if you really want to focus on or zero down on certain planets, what other criteria are you using that let me go for this, <coughs> let me go for that first? Mm -hmm. And that would be this. These are the planets. Right. So anything around Earth, I mean, those, for example, 296E, TOI, 700B, are these the ones you will be looking for first? Because they are like Earth-like, I mean, more, more Earth-like, I would say. Well, I would say they are in the habitable zone only, and they could be the targets. May not, we may not know they are more Earth-like or not. We will know they are more Earth-like only when we observe them. And so we say that, okay, because they are in the habitable zone, uh, I would want to focus on these kind of planets out of all the planets. <coughs> also, also um, not all of these planets are accessible. Some of them, for example, the 296E planet you mentioned uh, is about many hundred light years away. And our telescopes may not be able to observe them. So only a subset of these planets that are <coughs> nearby, uh, we will be able to observe. <clears throat> Hi, can I check on one more thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, during the Earthshine observation discussion, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned about moon also, like the sun coming from, sorry, the light coming from the sun being reflected on Earth and then on moon. Like, uh, why moon for that? in this um, spectrum? Because uh, we want to see a spectrum coming from an exoplanet. And, and the only way to do that, to see Earth as an exoplanet, that is, a, that is the idea here. We want to see Earth spectrum as an exoplanet spectrum. Okay, so for other exoplanets, we don't necessarily check the, their moons? Not necessarily. We don't. We don't need a moon there because then we can directly look at an exoplanet and get a spectrum. The idea here is that what if we get a spectrum from an exoplanet and let's say that is coming from and from outside Earth, we need to get that spectrum. And outside Earth spectrum is like coming from moon, right? And so that's why we right. um also had like this uh, similar question to Dr. Sula yesterday with regards to false positives and negatives. How do you rule out in when it comes to exoplanet um by signatures? Um, <clears throat> so we will, I would say that I will put a confidence <coughs> limit on, on my detection rather than ruling out something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so for example, if I detect a water feature here or a oxygen feature on this spectrum, I would say I have detected an oxygen feature in the spectrum of an exoplanet with this signal to noise ratio, with this confidence, 95% confidence. And so if you are asking me, uh, and I'll also say that uh, there, what are, and uh, in my paper, I'll also write, there could be other false positive mechanisms, but we will rule out with this kind of probability or uh, with this kind of confidence level. We can right. never rule out completely a false positive. Ever. We have uh, our next session on Monday now, Monday and Tuesday. So as a routine, we had mostly all the sessions starting from Wednesdays. Uh, but these two sessions we will be having Monday and Tuesday. On Science Day, we'll be having our last uh, session for the course. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi, for again, you know, yet another wonderful session. And Thanks all. Thank, thank you all. Nice. <clears throat> See you. See you. Bye. Bye.